Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Gorowski. I'll be your host for today. If you're just tuning in for the first time this month, we are getting close to that holiday season, but we still have about 20 or so live events before the Christmas break, connecting classrooms with scientists, explorers, adventurers, and conservationists from all around the world. If you head over to exploringbytheseat.com, you can find all the events we have coming up in December. Register for your spots uh, and get in on that action. So December is always a fun month. We always spend some time celebrating big cats and connecting with uh, scientists and researchers and conservationists uh, from around the world to share their stories and the work that they're doing with big cats. So we're going to spend a little time now uh, with Vincent Funameva. He is a, the Cheetah Metapopulation Coordinator for the Endangered Wildlife Trust. His research interests include the historical distribution of cheetah in Southern Africa, their genetic status, and the global decline of the cheetah population over the past 13,000 years. In 2017, Vincent was the recipient of the South African National Parks Kudu Award for individual contribution to conservation. He's also an explorer with the National Geographic Society. I'm gonna bring Vincent in live with us right now. Here we go. Hey, Vincent, how you doing today? Ah, doing well. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much for the uh, nice introduction. I see you got my uh, surname right this time. Did I? It's it's uh, it's a challenge for us here in in Canada, I think. But I, I think I, I think I got pretty close that time. Absolutely, absolutely. It's a Dutch surname. It means from the Merva River. <laughs> All right, very cool. Well, Vincent, uh, I'm going to let you take over for a little bit. We've got classrooms joining us from Canada and the United States today. And we might even squeeze a little Kahoot quiz in uh, as well. So I think it's going to be a lot of fun today. Thanks very much, Joe. Can I kick off? All right. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, Joe, I've got 45 minutes. Is that right? Uh, yeah. If you want to kind of share a little bit of your work for, say, 15 to 20 minutes, then we'll do some questions. Okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. All right, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak to you guys today. Um, I mean, if you look at this map here in front of you, uh, this is where cheetah were found uh, 13,000 years ago, right across Africa, except for the thick forests, and uh, right across the southwestern portion of Asia, there were an estimated 100,000 wild cheetahs worldwide. And... Um, in the past 13,000 years, the resident range, the historical range of cheetahs has decreased by 94%. And this, this has mainly been due to human factors, mainly habitat loss, uh, uh, you know, because of city development and because of crop farming, but also due to retaliatory killings, especially sheep and, and goat farmers. You know, cheetahs uh, kill sheep and goats and young cattle. And when this happens, then the farmers will often retaliate. Uh, and it's also quite interesting to look at the differing levels of destruction in the four geopolitical regions. So if you look at North Africa and Asia, West Africa, East Africa, Southern Africa, uh, human development has been happening in, 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 in North Africa and, and Southwestern Asia for 13,000 years. And that's why we have just 40 cheetah left there. Uh, 7,000 years of agriculture in West Africa, we have only 250 cheetah left. And if you look at uh, Southern Africa, we've only had 1,500 years of agriculture here in Southern Africa where I live. And that's why we have the most cheetahs. Uh, you know, we've had a lot less human development and a lot less agriculture down here in Southern Africa. And that's why, that's why we have 4,500 cheetah left. And if you look at the cheetahs from these different geopolitical regions, this is an Asiatic cheetah. You can see it's a very thin desert adapted cheetah. Uh, we got some. We, we're working in Iran, where the last remaining Asiatic uh, population lives, and uh, we obtained this very interesting footage the other day. Uh, this is a camel uh, monopolizing the water sources in the deserts there of 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 the Middle East, so preventing the cheetah from getting to the water source. Uh, and this just goes to show how humans and their livestock can impact wildlife. This is a West African cheetah. There's only 250 of them left. And uh, if you just go back to this Asiatic cheetah, there's only 40 of these guys left. But um, this is a West African cheetah, very pale color, 
um, a beautiful looking cheetah. There's 250 left. We've started a project in West Africa now to try and protect these uh, uh, West African cheetahs. Uh, here's some really interesting footage of the first West African cheetah that we we caught about three three four months ago. You can see uh, this animal, um, you know, sniffing around the camera trap, and uh, eventually he walked into the cage trap, and uh, we managed to respond within 20, 30 minutes and to get a collar on him, and we can see where he's walking now. Um, so we're gathering valuable, valuable information on West African cheetah. For the first time ever, we are getting insights in what these cheetah actually get up to. This is a Southern African cheetah. These are the strongest and largest cheetahs uh, with the largest population. Um, you can see they have a slightly browner, almost orangey uh, uh, coat. Uh, they're about 30% larger than Asiatic cheetahs. Very interesting to see the difference between the, the cheetahs from the different uh, geopolitical regions. So the reason why cheetah numbers have declined across the world is because of human population growth. In the blue line at the top, you can see that this human population growth started in North Africa, in the Middle East, way before it really kicked off in Africa. But in Africa, our human populations are now really starting to, to, to increase in number. Uh, and the sad news is that in the next 50 years, or the next 70 years, we're going to see the human population doubling in all four of these geopolitical regions, which means there's going to be more pressure on the cheetahs there. Um, if we zoom in on South Africa, where I, I do, uh, you know, where we started this project of mine, you can see uh, the colonial, uh, my colonial ancestors arrived here 400 years ago and they arrived with guns and horses and these were really bad news for cheetahs because it meant that cheetahs could be caught with more ease even though a horse is slower than a cheetah it can run a lot further and of course uh, a horseman with a gun is bad news for a cheetah so cheetah were wiped out from 95 percent of the historical range in south africa by the 1960s sorry the 1930s and we only had 400 cheetah and two populations left in the 1960s. Um, but then we had a wonderful development in South Africa. In 1994, democracy came to our country. And uh, with democracy coming to South Africa, Nelson Mandela became our president. Uh, there was a boom in tourism. And we had millions of tourists coming into our country wanting to see our charismatic large mammals. They wanted to see elephants, lions, rhinos, cheetahs, leopards. Converted protects. And uh, this was wonderful news for cheetahs, of course. Uh, and we started to introduce cheetahs into a number of newly created, very small protected areas. Uh, in fact, they were introduced, we started off this project with 41 small cheetah populations located across the country. And since we've started working on this project, we've managed to grow that population from 217 cheetahs to 468 cheetahs. So what exactly did we do to achieve this? Well, basically, we manage our wildlife. You know, long gone are the wild, wild, wide open spaces for cheetah to roam. So we have what we call a number of subpopulations. And we manage all these subpopulations as a single large Meta population. So you can see on your screen here seven populations of cheetah. Two of them are temporarily extinct. Two of them are doing very well. We call them source populations. And three of them are not doing so great for whatever reason. They are called sink populations. So when we see, okay, we have cheetah doing very well in this one source population, then we'll move individuals from that reserve to the sink populations. And in that way, we keep the sink populations going and we prevent overpopulation and we prevent inbreeding and we prevent underpopulation. So we call it metapopulation management. We work with uh, a current population, well, 67 protected areas, but we manage all the cheetah in those 67 protected areas as one single connected metapopulation. So my job is basically to swap cheetahs between all the protected areas. 
to prevent inbreeding, overpopulation, and underpopulation. And this method that we use has been very successful. You know, we, um, we're managing at the moment the only growing wild cheetah population worldwide. Uh, uh, South Africa and Malawi, which Malawi is the other country where we work, they're the only countries worldwide with growing wild cheetah populations. And the main reason for this is because we've, we've, we've put fences around our protected areas. We've realized that there are just too many people and too many sheep and goats and cattle and too much livestock in Africa uh, for the wildlife to just walk around freely. All of our protected areas are completely fenced. Uh, and this prevents the cheetahs from attacking the farmer's livestock and it prevents the farmers and poachers from getting into uh, the cheetah habitat and getting into the rhino habitat and it pr protects our wildlife. Uh, the problem with fencing is that it stops natural gene flow. So it prevents animals from moving across the landscape and, uh, landscape and spreading their genes. So for this reason, I have to artificially swap them, artificially move them. So we will go with a veterinarian, we will dart a cheetah, and we'll load it on the back of a, a pickup or a bucky, as we call it here in Africa, and then we'll load them into aeroplanes, and we will move them between the protected areas. And if you look at a map of Africa today, it's very easy to see where the protected areas are because they're the only bits of greenery left in the landscape. If you fly over Africa today, this is most likely what you're going to see. It's very unlikely that you're going to see this, because long gone are the wide open spaces for wildlife to roam freely. Most of Africa is populated by humans. And uh, so it's been very interesting for me, you know, to move cheetah between 67 protected areas located across four different countries. You know, these protected areas have very different climatic variables. Some have a lot of rain, some have very little rain. Some of them are very cold, some are very hot. Some have high densities of cheetah food. Some have very low densities of cheetah food. The cheetah has to walk 20 kilometers to find food. Where some, in some of, our, of these protected areas, they have to walk 500 meters to find something to eat. Uh, and also they have different densities of competing predators. So one thing, if you work with cheetahs, that you'll realize very quickly is that they're the weakest of the large carnivores. They're very easily killed by lions and by leopards and by hyenas and by wild dogs. And uh, if there's a lot of lion, leopard and hyenas out there, then the cheetahs are really going to, 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 to struggle to survive. So in this meta population that I work with, we have four semi-desert reserves. We have seven thicket reserves with very thick vegetation. We have nine Karoo semi-desert reserves where temperatures get so low in winter that it snows. We have three flood, floodplain grassland reserves where temperatures can reach 50 degrees Celsius in the summer. Very, very hot place. We have 18 low felt savanna reserves where there's a lot of leopards running around. And you can see from the bottom of the screen this cheetah running away from a leopard. We have three grassland reserves. Previously, cheetah would have done very well in the grasslands because they can use their speed in, the, in, in, in grassland habitat. But um, unfortunately, grassland is also very good for agriculture. So we have very few grassland reserves left. Cheetahs surprisingly do quite well in mountains, and we have 18 mountainous savanna reserves and four coastal dune forest reserves. You know, recently we've been working a lot in these coast and coastal dune forests, and you, it's difficult to imagine seeing a cheetah in forest habitat, but they, they really do adapt very well to, to new surroundings. And uh, what we find is that when we move cheetah between these different protected areas, um, you know, there's a 50% chance that that cheetah is going to su survive at least two years after you release it. The only real difference is when we move them into the semi-desert rocky Karoo habitat, as you can see here. Because in this rocky habitat, the cheetah can't really run at full speed. It can't use its main asset. Of course, as you all know, the cheetah is the fastest mammal of them all, land mammal. And uh, its main asset, its main strong point is its speed. And uh, in this rocky habitat, they can't maximize the use of their speed. And when we move cheetahs into this habitat, they tend to struggle. But if we take them out of this habitat, they really do very well. So why do we swap cheetahs between all these 
protected areas. Uh, the main reason for this is because of the genetic rules. We know from the human experience, uh, way before we even knew what DNA was, that it's not good for brothers and sisters to breed and for cousins to breed. Um, and, and, and the same rules apply to our cheetahs. Uh, if we see, uh, you know, re relatives breeding, then they are more susceptible to disease. They have slower growth rates, uh, lower birth rates. They have something called fluctuating asymmetry. They look funny. And uh, so this is something that we really do try and prevent. So the main killers of cheetahs uh, in the the systems, the savannah, uh, well, the, the, the various reserves that we work in, the main killers of cheetahs are lion. 31% uh, of our cheetah mortality is due to lion. 9% due to leopard. 8% is cheetah kill each other, of course. They comp the males compete for females. And, uh, and then various other factors. Hyenas kill cheetahs. Sometimes they try and kill something which is too big and they get killed by their prey animals and, and so on and so forth. And despite the fences... Humans are still responsible for 24% for of cheetah mortalities in, our, in the protected areas that we work in. I thought I'd show you guys some interesting footage here. So what happens when cheetahs and lions bump into each other? As you can see from this footage over here, a mother cheetah with two young cubs has bumped into two very big male lions. And uh, you can see... Uh, her cubs, there's uh, three, three cubs in the background there. They know exactly what to do. They know that the lions are bad news. They know that the lions are out there to get them. And fortunately, their mother is protecting them. So their mother will pull the lions away from the cubs uh, so as to prevent uh, uh, mortality or death. We don't know why, why lions have such a hatred for cheetahs, why they always try and kill cheetahs. Uh, they don't really eat the same thing. Cheetah eat much smaller animals than lions. But we do know that whenever lions see cheetahs, they always do try and catch and kill them. This is a very interesting interaction between a, a leopard and uh, two male cheetahs. Normally, leopard kill cheetahs very easily. But uh, in this case, you can see the cheetahs actually fighting back. Uh, and very interestingly, about a minute or two later, um, this this uh, this this uh, leopard actually ran away. <laughs> It's a very rare to see a leopard running away from, from cheetahs. But obviously, in this case, there were two cheetahs and only one leopard. In most cases, a leopard attack and easily kill cheetahs. You can see this male, leopard, this male cheetah here managed to just get, get away in time. But in the next slide, you can see a, a young, young cheetah cub running away from a leopard. And uh, unfortunately, um, unfortunately, the uh, the leopard managed to catch the cheetah. The mother, the mother cheetah, arrived just afterwards to try and protect her cub, but it was too late, and the cub's neck was broken. So um, this is some interesting footage of hyena. Uh, very easily, as you can see, uh, one hyena very easily stealing the food of two cheetahs. And off he goes with their food. We haven't seen spotted hyena uh, kill, actively kill cheetah. We know they eat cheetah cubs, but uh, when they come across a cheetah carcass in the bush, they definitely will feed on it. If there's a lot of cheetahs and only one hyena, then the cheetahs do have a chance of fighting back and chasing the hyena away. So this may sound all very depressing. You know, cheetahs getting killed by lions, le leopards, and hyenas, but we can tell you for sure that uh, if, if you don't have all these competing predators out there in the in the in the in the bush, try you know uh, uh, controlling cheetah populations, cheetah breed very successfully. A cheetah can have up to seven cubs and can raise all seven of them to adulthood. 
And uh, we've seen on some of our reserves, uh, for example, Mountain Zebra National Park, we started off with a small population of three cheetahs. And we, when we looked again, we had uh, 35 cheetahs So cheat, uh, in, in just three years' time. So they can breed very, very. quickly cheetahs to captivity so there's people uh, out there in the world who want cheetahs as pets and this is because cheetahs are not dangerous to humans like lions and leopards are and uh, this is something that we're really trying to stop is the sale of wild cheetahs to captivity i've uh, observed this firsthand in somalia You can see over here, these are two little cheetah cubs that were stolen from their mother by, by uh, poachers. And uh, when we managed to rescue them, two of them were already dead. Here's uh, another seven or eight in the back of the car here, stolen and taken away from their mothers so that they can be house pets. And this is really something that uh, we're fighting hard against. This footage was taken in Somalia. You can see this little cheetah here still breathing but really on his last legs, and uh, he didn't make it through the night. Um, so, yes, we, we really are trying to prevent the sale of uh, cheetahs as, as pets to humans because we know what humans do with animals when they have them as pets. I'm sure most of you will know that the wolf is the ancestor of all dogs, and it took humans just 15,000 years to turn a wild and functional wolf into all the different kinds of dogs that you find today. And the same with cats. It took us just 10,000 years to convert uh, these cats, uh, the African wild cat, into all the do domestic house cats that you get there. And we really don't want to see the cheetah going the same way with cheetah breeders selecting against, uh, you know, for selecting for different looking cheetahs and changing cheetahs from what we know them to be. Uh, what, we don't want to see cheetahs living with humans and going for walks with humans and being pets. We want to see them wild and functional and doing what cheetahs have been doing for millions of years. And that is catching their own food, knowing what to do when they see lion, and that is run and run very fast, knowing what to do when they see leopard, and that is to run. And uh, yes, we want wild and functional cheetahs. So uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk. I, I see I went a little bit over time there. Sorry about that, Joe. And a very big thank you to our donors, especially National Geographic, the Ford Wildlife Foundation, and PwC. And uh, without uh, their support, we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing. Thanks All very right. much. Thank you, Vincent. That was great. Thank you for that look into the threats that cheaters are facing. Uh, but then also, you know, the important conservation work that's being done to try and protect uh, the populations and grow them. And, you know, I, it's, it's hard to think of Africa as these wild spaces slowly being fortressed and walled off. But unfortunately, that's, that's kind of just the reality. If we want to protect some of these wild places and, and the animals within, you have to add that extra level of, of protection. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Well, what I think we'll do is play a really quick Kahoot quiz before some questions, Vincent. So while you were presenting, I pulled together a few multiple choice questions for our classrooms. I'm gonna share um, a link up here. So if you're in your classroom uh, and you have one-to-one -one technology, uh, you can use something at your seat uh, or if you're tuning in from home, uh, if you are, don't have that, your teacher can open it at the front of the room. You can shout out your answers, or you can just play for fun without logging in, uh, in your classroom. So visit kahoot.it, uh, and you will find the link, uh, for the event there waiting for you. And then I'm going to, oops, it looks like the quiz didn't load on my end. So just give me two seconds to fix that. There we go. And we should be able to load it now. Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen and you can enter your PIN number now. Here we go. All right, so there's the PIN number. I'll give a few seconds for classrooms to join. 569-7501. Uh, you can join from home on your devices, from your school on your devices, or your teacher can pop it up 
uh, at the front of the classroom for you. Uh, and you guys can shout out your answers. So there we go. We have some students joining us now. We'll give another minute or two here to get a few more students in and then we'll go live. I see a few classrooms too. There's Mr. S is in there. Uh, all right, awesome. Let's see if we hit 50 students and then we'll take things live. Perfect. Okay, let's go live with our quiz. See how well we are paying attention and what we learned about cheetahs today. Question one, about how many cheetahs were there 13,000 years ago? Was it 10,000, 50,000, 100,000, or 2 million? So Vincent said that about 13,000 years ago, the population started to decline. Uh, let's see who was paying attention. All right, most students went with 100,000. Let's see what the leaderboard looks like right now. Trent is in the lead, but it's pretty close. Let's see what happens on our second question. What's an Asiatic cheetah look like? Is it larger than other cheetahs? Is it thin and desert adapted? Did it have stripes instead of spots? Or did it have longer tails and ears? Couple more seconds on the question. All right, good job out there. Thin and desert adapted. Shifting the leaderboard, Joey Y has taken the lead. And let's go to question three. South African cheetahs are the loudest cheetahs, the smelliest cheetahs, the smallest population, or the strongest and largest uh, of the cheetahs. All right, most students went with uh, strongest and largest. That's correct. And Vincent, I don't know for sure. You probably know better than me. Maybe they are the smelliest of all the cheetahs. <laughs> all right, let's see if our scoreboard Ice Cube has taken the lead with a streak of three questions in a row. Good job. Question four, anything can happen. What's the largest contributor to cheetah decline? What has it been? Was it the increase of human population? Was it predators? Was it climate change uh, or was it poaching? All right, good job out there. Most of the students went with human population increase. Those other ones are definitely a factor, but uh, changing human population, uh, the biggest. So third place, Slim Shady. Wow, we got someone famous in the event. Number two, Animal Girl. And number one, how are we doing? Ryder taking number one at the last moment. All right, good stuff. Well, thanks to everybody who joined us for our Kahoot quiz action today. That was fun as always. Uh, but let's jump into uh, a little Q&A action. So if you're tuning in via YouTube, type your questions in the chat. We'll work some of those in. But uh, let's see here. Let's go to Mrs. Deer's class first. Let's bring them in live. There they are. Hey, everyone. Hello. All right. Good to see you. They are joining us from Virginia. Looks like some seventh graders. Uh, we're ready for a question. All right. This question is from Atticus. And he wonders, how do you know how many cheetahs there are in these subpopulations? <laughs> yes, a very good question. That's a very good question. So we've uh, slowly started to partner up with people from all over the world and uh, to make an effort to count how many cheetahs we have. But it's, it can be very difficult to, to get good estimates. So what we do is we set up a camera trap grid so we put camera traps right across all the protected areas in Africa and in Asia. And then we get an, a rough idea of the density of the cheetahs. And sometimes we can count even individuals in the population because every cheetah has different spots. So, so basically we can identify all the different individuals. So we have people working in all the protected areas where there are still cheetahs left. 
And these people have a rough idea of how many cheetah are in each population. And then we put all that information together and we know that there's just over 7,000 cheetahs left in the wild today. So we, so 13,000 years ago, we still had 100,000 cheetahs. Today, we just have about 7,000 left. All right. Great question to get us started. And I think that's so cool too, the spot patterns, just like our fingerprints or uh, whale tails or spots on a whale shark. We can identify them uh, by those unique markings. Uh, okay, uh, we're going to go now to Maine. We have some fourth graders joining us in Maine with Miss McGinnis. I'm going to bring them in now. There they are. Hey, fourth graders. Hello, so, I'm Jake. Ah, so boy. Hi. Hello, I'm Jake. What can kids do to increase cheetah population? Well, the best thing that you can do is come and visit us here in Africa. So you can convince your parents to come and visit us because we need tourism. Because uh, when you come and visit us from Canada and from the USA, you bring your valuable US dollars and I'm not sure what the Canadian currency is, Joe. I think you can help me there. <laughs> but yeah, it's you just bring your, Canadian dollar. your valuable yeah. uh, a foreign, uh, a foreign, um, a, a, a foreign exchange into Africa. And uh, what we've realized in Africa is that tourism plays a very important role in, in protecting cheetahs. And uh, if you don't have tourists in a protected area, then there's, uh, the government doesn't have an incentive to look after those cheetahs. So come and visit us and come and see our wildlife. I can guarantee you uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful experience. You won't only see cheetahs, you'll see lions and leopards and elephants and buffaloes and, and rhinos and all kinds of things. So, so come and visit us here in Africa and help us protect our wildlife. I think that's great. I hope all the students go home tonight and start the campaign to convince their parents to take them uh, on safari because you're absolutely right. You know, most people want to protect their natural habitat or, you know, the wild spaces around them, but sometimes circumstance doesn't allow that, the, you know, the need to survive. So if there's good jobs uh, and, and, and such, then uh, people are more than happy to, to, to protect their wild places. All right, uh, let's go to another group here. Mr. Steltman's crew are hanging out with us virtually. They're here in Canada, some fourth graders. Let's bring them in there. Hey, Mr. Steltman, how's it going? Good, uh, we had a couple of questions. One was they wanted to know how old can cheetahs live up to? So they're wondering like their maximum age on average. And then yeah. also we yeah. had another student who wanted to know what type of, they yes, yes, they can hear you, they stop talking. Hold on. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. And they want to know what types of cameras you use. Not supposed to use them. Sorry, Joe. I, I, I lost my connection there. Uh, was, did I, was there a question? Yeah. Uh, two, two questions. How old can cheetahs live to be in the wild? And then what kind of cameras are you using uh, when trapping, when camera trapping? Yes, uh, because, uh, you know, in, in one protected area, you, you might need up to 400 cameras to count all the cheetahs there. So we have to buy very cheap uh, uh, camera traps. So, so it's not the best quality uh, uh, cameras, but enough to see, uh, you know, individual spot patterns. And um, so we call them just a, a camera trap. You get a white flash camera trap that uh, it gives a little bit of a, a flash so that at nighttime you can get a better view of the of the cheetah but sometimes that flash can be a little bit disturbing so in that case we use an infrared uh, a camera trap which doesn't disturb the animal as it walks past um so so yes we use uh, various kinds of camera traps to to count our cheetahs and then with regards to cheetahs lifespan um, you know, the average cheetah does not even live past a year because it's such a difficult place to, to survive. You know, everything's out there to get you. There's disease, there's competing predators, lions, leopards, hyena. The mom, obviously, when she goes in to find food for her cubs, um, you know, uh, they stay behind and become extremely vulnerable. So the average lifespan for a, for a wild cheetah is less than one year. But, um, you know, if, if a cheetah is successful and it gets through that initial period of its life, that difficult period, cheetahs can live up to 12, 13 years in the wild. I think the, the oldest cheetah that we had in the wild was, was 15 years old. But the average lifespan uh, for, for a cheetah is about one year. 
And uh, if they get to, to five, six years, they've done very well. All right, let's take a little journey here to Aurelia, some fifth and sixth graders uh, with Mrs. Lobb. How are we doing, everyone? Here they are. Um, so I was wondering. Did you forget? Did you forget? <laughs> it's okay. No worries. It happens. Yeah. Hi. Uh, okay, hi, I'm hi, I'm Nathan. Uh, Vincent, what do you think it would be like if cheetahs were repopulated to a big amount again? What do you think life would be like for us and cheetahs? If they were repopulated to? Uh, if they reached more of their historical size, I think he's mm -hmm. thinking if there were lots more cheetahs, how would that change mm -hmm. things? Well, I think Vincent's connection might have froze on us. Let's give it a second, see if it if it unfreezes for us. Yeah, I think it froze too. That's okay. We'll give him a minute and see if it, uh, if it pops back for us. And then get your questions ready in the classroom because we're going to try and do a speed round to get through uh, each classroom. See if we can get one more question in. Um, we might, Vincent might, he might disappear and then come back in. That might happen if it's really frozen on us. Okay. Uh, okay. But we'll give it just a minute here uh, and see what happens. <laughs> While we wait, what I might do is just really quickly uh, share a link here up on the screen if you want to uh, see a little bit more. Uh, of the work, I'm just going to grab a link here. And let's get that ready to share as well. Yeah, and Vincent just disappeared. So that hopefully means he's gonna click the link again uh, and come back in and join us. Uh, and then we'll continue uh, rolling things along. So hopefully you've got your questions ready. There's Vincent. Oh, sorry, Joe. Have you got me there? Yeah, yeah, that's okay. We just, uh, it froze, but it looks like you got back in. So that's great. Um, okay. And we, ha we had a question from our crew in Aurelia all queued up. They were wondering if the cheetah population grows a lot, kind of gets more towards what it might have been like in the past. How might that change things? How might things be different if that happens? Yes, I mean that's a, that's a difficult question. You know that um, sometimes our, our in some of our reserves, our cheetah population reaches capacity, and that's not a good thing because uh, obviously then the cheetah kill too much and they eat too much prey and they they wipe out prey species. So so we have developed measures to deal with that on some of our reserves where cheetah are too successful and have uh, uh, you know there's an overpopulation. Uh, so what we sometimes do is we will contracept the cheetahs and, um, uh, uh, you know, to prevent them from, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, to, to prevent them from, from, from overpopulating. All right. And then I'm sure, you know, when possible too, moving them to other reserves is probably an option uh, as well. Absolutely. At this point in time, we've got a lot of space for cheetahs in Africa. So right now, uh, we are we are basically, um, you know, when we have an overpopulation, we move them to other reserves. But there have been times in the past where we don't have enough space for for some of our cheetahs, and um, uh, um, you know, we have to sometimes do a contracept them, which means that we prevent females from being able to give birth. But uh, at this stage, uh, we, are, we, we are not doing that. We've got a massive demand for cheetahs at the moment. Um, right now, the, the India is looking at cheetah reintroduction. So the last wow. wild cheetah in, um, in India was in 1948. A cheetah went extinct there. And, uh, and basically, um, uh, you know, there's enough space in India for up to three, 400 cheetahs. So in the next uh, five, six, seven, eight years of my career, uh, that will be uh, my focus is moving surplus South African cheetah to India. So, so a lot of, a lot of work still has to happen. Amazing. Very cool, Vincent. Uh, Mrs. Deer's class, do you have a final question? There they are. <laughs> yes, we do. I'm actually merging a few questions together from my students. 
And a lot wonder, how do baby cheetah appearances differ from adult cheetah appearances? And um, you've already answered one of our other questions, which was about their, their lifespan, and, and um, thank you for that. Okay. So that's a very interesting question. So you will remember from what I said to you earlier about uh, baby cheetahs, or we call them cubs. Um, you know, they have this very strange uh, a gray mane on the back uh, on the on the, on their backs, and this is to allow them to mimic a honey badger. And a honey badger is a notoriously aggressive small mammal that occurs in Africa. And uh, they, even though they're very small, they're incredibly aggressive and they're not scared to attack leopards and they're not scared to attack lions and to even attack buffalo. So, so cheetah uh, cubs have over time come to mimic uh, honey badgers and, uh, and this offers them some level of protection against uh, other animals that want to eat them. Uh, for example, uh, leopards and baboons and jackals and hyenas. Uh, they they mimic honey badgers. They have this grey fur down the down their backs, uh, which makes them look different from um, adult cheetahs. All right, that's a really cool adaptation. And then some homework too. Look up honey badgers and see uh, make that comparison. Very cool. Uh, Maine, Miss McGinnis's crew. Do you guys have one more question for us? Hi, my name is Sydney. And what do you love best about cheetahs? Um, yes, yes. Now that's a, that's a good question. I've obviously worked with them for 10 years now. And, um, uh, you know, they really are the underdogs of, of, of the large carnivore world. You know, the elements are against them. You know, you go spend time in, in the habitat where cheetahs live. It's an extremely tough place to live. It's very hot in the middle of the day. It's very cold late at night. There's snakes, there's scorpions. It's, you have to walk incredibly far to find food. You know, it's, um, there's a rocky habitat. There's leopards that are trying to ambush you. Lions are trying to kill you. Um, you know, hyenas are trying to kill your cubs. And whenever you catch something to eat, you all have to eat so fast because there's going to be some wild dogs that are just two minutes away that are going to come and steal your food. And, you know, so they, they, all the elements are against them and they're so thin and they, they're not strong like other competing predators. And you always think to yourself, how do they survive out there? And uh, they, they really are true survivors. You know, they, despite all the odds, despite being the weakest of the large predators, uh, cheetahs are exceptionally, ex exceptionally resilient animals and very adaptable. And they, you know, just their will to survive is, 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 is what I find most special about them. All right. And we'll give our final question to Mrs. Lobb's crew. If you guys have one more question for us. Hi, my name is Ilya. And um, how do you breed the cheetahs to have more cheetahs? Yes. Yeah, so, so that's one of my jobs is, you know, on some of our reserves, we'll have only two males or just one female. And, um, and then a leopard will kill the one female and you, you only have males. So I'm, I'm basically a control tower for the cheetah populations. I'm sitting in a, on my computer, which is the control tower, and I'm looking at what's going on on each of the reserves, of the 67 reserves. And if I see, oh, goodness me, we have a beautiful female cheetah here and she's got no male company – then I will move two cheetahs towards her uh, and we will relocate two cheetahs into that reserve where she lives. But there's nothing that you can do to promote inbreeding. Uh, sorry, to promote breeding. You know, uh, uh, cheetahs, what we've realized is that, you know, for cheetahs to breed, there just has to be both sexes present. There needs to be a male and a female. And the females are really not fussy about who their boyfriends are. They they pretty much uh, uh, happy to, 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 to uh, make a family with any boy. And uh, the same for, for, for male cheetahs. They are not fussy about who their partners are. So as long as you have both, uh, both males and females on your reserve, you will have a breeding population. So my job is just to make sure that each and every reserve that I have, that I work with, has both males and females present. 
All right, excellent. Well, I wanna start off with a shout out to our classrooms, our classrooms on YouTube, our classrooms who joined us live on camera today. Thank you for the great questions. In fact, I'm gonna pop a few of the classrooms in right now if they wanna give a big wave. <laughs> great to have you join us today. Thank you for those awesome questions. Vincent, I know you're a busy guy traveling and moving cheetahs and doing great conservation work. So thank you so much uh, for letting us steal a little bit of your time today and sharing the, the incredible conservation work you're doing to, to help grow our cheetah population. Absolutely. And thanks very much for the opportunity to chat to all of you guys. It's been an absolute pr pleasure. And uh, thanks for the enthusiasm. And come visit us here in Africa. And if some of you want one day, if you really like it here, yeah, come and work in this continent. Uh, we need a, we need all the help we can get. And uh, thanks very much for your time. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great rest of the week. Uh, and we'll see you in another event soon. Thanks, everyone.